It's a pleasure to be introduced by a leader of Seattle, uh, Democratic Socialists of America, and uh, to have that group co-hosting our gathering this evening with the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies. You know, in our culture, when you use the expression, that's history, it's usually a dismissive term. <laughs> but history is how we got to where we are. And I think in this context of trying to understand as clearly as we can where the Democratic Party is now, where it came from, and where it might be created to go in the future, it's helpful to go back, oh, say about eight decades to Madison Square Garden in 1936 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt stood in front of the crowd and talked about the oligarchs of the era, the wealthy, the rich, the manipulators uh, who were accustomed to running the major institutions and the economy of the country. And four years into his presidency, FDR said of those oligarchs and wealthy interests, they hate me and I welcome their hatred. So fast forward uh, to, let's say, 2012, when another Democratic president was running for re-election. And Barack Obama at that point didn't quite say it this way, but he pretty much conveyed through his words and actions that the wealthy of this decade maybe didn't like him too much, maybe on Wall Street he wasn't tremendously popular, but the message was uh, maybe they don't like me, but I want them to like me. And that is a crystal clear contrast between a high point of Democratic Party leadership in relationship to Wall Street and the wealthy in the 1930s and the era that we live in today, the conciliatory suck-up policies from the top of the Democratic Party towards Wall Street, the big banks, and the oligarchy. And that is, unfortunately, in 2018, the situation that we find ourselves in today, where de facto there is a tacit sense of a division of labor from the top of the Democratic Party nationally, that working people, people of color, labor, organized and unorganized, they have a, we have a very important role, make no mistake. We should support Democratic Party candidates. We should send in money. We should canvas. If we're dedicated enough, we should go door to door. We should turn out and vote. That is our job. And the job of the big donor class on Wall Street is to constrain the policies that will be pursued and advanced by the Democratic Party leadership. And this is a, as I say, tacit concept of how this party moves forward. So if we were to do a retrospective, you know, uh, the, uh, you know the old uh, joke that somebody took a uh, speed reading course and then read War and Peace and then gave the book report and the entire book report uh, was the following, it's about Russia. You know? So you don't want to compress too much or read history too fast or anything too fast. But still in all, we do want to see the contours of what's happened since the 30s when not coincidentally FDR was talking in that way and the labor movement gathered tremendous speed that changed the history of this country, the contours of development of our society from that day to this. And as FDR was said to have told people who came to him, such as A. Philip Randolph, leaders of uh, civic organizations and labor uh, movements, make me do it and people made him do it. It wasn't because he was just such a tremendously nice guy. Of course, he was a, a wealthy guy, but social movements made that happen. Right? And so by 1948, whatever his militarism and so forth, uh, 
President Truman saw absolutely, truly universal health care as a goal. And there was the sense that the New Deal was not something to strangle and asphyxiate, but something to be advanced, to be put forward, to build on. And you know, sometimes there's a misconception that Social Security uh, came out of the Great Society. Of course, it did not. It came out of the 30s. It came because working people and want to be working people fought for Social Security. And so then we can go through the 50s, and even when Eisenhower was supporting what? Or under that era, a 90% marginal tax rate for the wealthy, you know, which would now be considered, uh, forget about uh, Marxist if we advance that, now we'd be told we were like uh, Leninist Maoists, you know, to talk about the return to the 50s rate. And then 1964 and 65, not coincidentally with this huge tide of the civil rights movement, we got Medicare. I'm just about old enough, I am old enough to remember the debates in 1964 and 65 about this new idea called Medicare. And it was roundly denounced by the right wing and by conservative Democrats. Is that socialism? We can't have this thing called Medicare, it's socialism. But there was a mobilization, there was a constituency, and there was a receptivity and in many ways a willingness to provide leadership from top Democrats to make Medicare a reality, things that now people take, unfortunately, for granted as it's under attack from the Republican Party and some of the Democratic Party's so-called leadership as well. And then in the 1970s, we had this gradual erosion. You'll remember, perhaps, that when Ted Kennedy in the late 1970s announced he was going to run for president, challenge a sitting president, right? Jimmy Carter, who didn't appreciate it, and there was this famous interview on CBS with Ted Kennedy, and he was asked, well, why do you want to be president? And his answer was so fumbly that it sank his effort to win the nomination instead of Jimmy Carter for the 1980 convention. But if you look at what happened in the first two years and the last two years of the Carter administration, you saw an escalation of military spending and you saw one cut after another for domestic social programs. And then in retreat, rather than fighting for programs and the common wheel, we had the Democratic Party losing to the so-called revolution, the counter-revolution, we should call it the Reagan counter-revolution, and we suffered through an era that we continue to see many of the, the malign and damaging and sometimes deadly results of those eight years under Reagan and then another four years under the first, as it turned out, President Bush. And in fact, you could make an argument that much of the homelessness that we're dealing with today is rooted in that right-wing triumph of the Reagan-Bush era. And what was the response to that? Well, you had some progressives in the Democratic Party, like Fred Harris, who said, we need to reinvigorate the concept and advance the concept, not just be in the defensive crouch, but that there's a public sector, that our society and our world is not for sale that we're going to fight for these principles and see Medicare and Social Security, unemployment compensation, Medicaid as a floor to build on, not something to erode. But instead, we had the pilgrimage to the wealthy home in Virginia of Pamela, uh, Pamela Harriman. And the pilgrimage was won by a fella named Bill Clinton. And the New Democrats were born with a lot of think tank funding and media support. We had this thing called the Democratic Leadership Council. And on that wave came in eight years of the Clinton-Gore administration. And I think it's important as we try to gauge 
how we got where we are now to dwell a bit on those eight years. What we had was a new kind of rhetoric that corresponded to a new, or at least a revanchist approach to what politics could be in our country. Now, the wealthy donors who got behind uh, Clinton and then his running mate Gore, but especially to make sure as best they could that Clinton would be the nominee, were part of a huge wave. I think it's important you know, to reflect that during that era in the 1980s, there was a gathering assault on what was called disparagingly the welfare state. And so you had columnists like John Leo at US News and World Report. You had George Will. You had, who was made famous by the liberal Washington Post, and then he's put on TV, and you know, we still live with him or tolerate or have to deal with his media messaging today, and a fellow named Joe Klein, who's still writing for Time Magazine. And we're, we often forget that those three were some of the leaders, and Klein, a liberal, attacking women on welfare, saying that it's these black women, these families of color, that are eroding our national treasury, that they didn't have the proper morality, that they were living on the dole. And this was a media atmosphere, corporately subsidized in the 1980s, that helped create the wave that Bill Clinton rode into office on, rode all the way to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And then what did we get under that administration? Well, initially, from the outset, we got an alliance between corporate Democrats and the Republican Party. That's how we got NAFTA. It was only because the Republican Party teamed up with Bill Clinton and the Democrats in Congress who Clinton could bludgeon and intimidate that got us NAFTA under the rhetoric of so-called free trade. And then again, getting more momentum, drawing on the right-wing radio barrage and the right-wing media and a lot of the centrist messaging through the media, there was born welfare reform. And so there was no talk of dealing with the dollars that were going to the Pentagon. There was no dealing with the subsidies of money going to Wall Street and the big corporations. There was, with no small amount of classism and misogyny and racism, the targeting of people on welfare. And so there was, in 1996, on the eve of the election uh, between Bob Dole and then President Clinton, the enactment of welfare reform in five years, and you gotta go get a job, and all the rest of it. And this is what was presented as one of the fine achievements of New Democrats. So then, as we know, we ended up with eight years of George W. Bush as president. And then we had a Democrat come in, as it turned out, for eight years, and like Bill Clinton before him, Barack Obama, to have credibility nationally in the money primary and the mass media corporate primary, there needed to be some big donors, some big checks, some networking and bundling, a stamp of approval from the very wealthy. So who better to do that than someone who was a huge profiteer from the subprime mortgages that victimized so many low-income people, disproportionately people of color, huge transfer of wealth away from working, low, middle-class income people uh, to the, the banks and the speculators and uh, her name was Penny Pritzker. Uh, I think about $2 billion of uh, wealth, inherited wealth, 
the major hotel chain, and later was rewarded by being made Secretary of Commerce. Now just, you know, you could sort of step back and think about that. I mean, how many people are there to choose from who could be qualified and exemplary as a Secretary of Commerce? I guess it, you would have to choose somebody with $2 billion of personal wealth who helped get you in the White House in the first place. Right? Just as, who would you put in your cabinet to be a Treasury Secretary, an economic advisor in the White House? Who would, who would that be? I guess it would have to be uh, uh, people from uh, some of the biggest Wall Street banks and investment firms, which is what the Obama administration was about economically. And so as the rising tide of anger, of frustration, with increases in health care costs, with college tuition going through the roof, with people losing their homes, the Democratic Party in power rescued the big banks but not people whose houses were underwater, and conveyed a profound message. That's the dual track messaging that unfortunately we got then eight years later from the 2016 Democratic presidential nominee, which is, we're with you. We're with you low income people. We're with you middle class people. We're with you women who are suffering from the feminization of poverty. We're with you children and you elderly and you retired people who are wondering how you're going to pay your bills or buy your medicine. We're with you and we're going to make sure that the banks and the Wall Street firms like us. And that was going along just swimmingly, which is cheer-led that kind of outlook is cheer-led overwhelmingly uh, by the mass media, the corporate owned and operated and advertised media. And I include in that category the corporate subsidized and underwritten media such as All Things Considered, Morning Edition, the News Hour on PBS. These are entities, these are, let's be blunt about it, propaganda systems. And if you pulled the thread on these messages, it was always since the 80s. The Democratic Party is too far left. It needs to move to the center, right? And in the name of the center, there's a tremendous propaganda barrage. See, we've been brainwashed, the news media brainwashed us to believe if it's the center, perhaps what C. Wright Mills quite correctly called the, the crackpot realism, the center. If it's the center, it's not propaganda. You know? If it's the center that supports Wall Street, it's not propaganda. It's o only people who are beyond there that are propagandists. But that messaging that has been very powerful since the 80s, that the Democratic Party has to move to the center because it's on the fringe to really support working people and want to be working people, that was incorporated, accepted, and was used to play to the gallery by the Obama administration and the Democratic Party leadership on Capitol Hill. And so that was the cheering squad. That was the gallery that was being satisfied by that sort of rhetoric and policy in the first years of the Obama administration. The press corps in Washington except the right-wing press corps, but generally there was a lot of support. I mean, let's face it, the Obama administration was well-liked and well-supported. It wasn't like uh, these you know, extremists in the Democratic Party like Dennis Kucinich or the outliers like a, a Bernie Sanders. No, it was Barack Obama who understood that you needed to be in the center, whatever that is, because that was the formula uh, to have success. Electorally. And as it turned out, this is a sort of a, a, a paradigm, but also a paradox for how we've been conditioned, including myself, for most of our political lives, to think of a political spectrum as horizontal line left right. And then where do you fit on that spectrum? Where do you fit uh, 
between the right wing and the left wing and somewhere in between. It's very neat, it's very tidy. I think it used to work better in the past than it does now. But then you, you look at certain issues like, like trade, like these corporate trade pacts, like uh, NAFTA, like as those of us who were in the streets in Seattle at the end of 1999 outside the WTO, and I was glad to be uh, one of those thousands blockading the WTO here in this city in Seattle, that whether it's NAFTA or WTO, uh, we have, or, or other uh, attempts to systematize corporate domination of the economies internationally, there was this uh, attitude that uh, this could be the formula because this was the sane way to organize economic relations. So this was the conventional wisdom. Democratic Party, mass media, etc. The only problem, or the huge problem was, that more and more people were suffering under this kind of regimen. And it came to be, in a sense, the, the political uh, elites more and more were conveying, and the mass media to a large degree, were conveying to people sitting at home, anywhere, who are you going to believe, us or your own eyes? People here, oh, the economy's doing really well. But then they would sit at the kitchen table and think, what the hell are we going to do? Look at these bills coming in. Our kids want to go to college. Look at these rising costs. What about health care? All these issues. And so the disconnect began to grow. And there were rumblings, there were huge rumblings. And one of them was called Occupy. It was a reflection of what was going on, and it was a, a boost in what was going on, because it was direct action that was manifesting people's rage. And despite the mass media efforts and the Democratic Party efforts and Republican Party efforts to discount what Occupy was about, Whatever its limitations, and let's face it, every movement has its limitations, Occupy was tremendously important. And it raised to the national profile, even in the corporate mass media, the issue of economic inequality. Exactly one of the most important topics to be avoided. You know, it's hidden in plain sight. Why should we talk about economic inequality? That's just the way it is, it's, it's, it's nature. Like, sometimes it rains, sometimes it's sunny, but it's always economic inequality. And so, what's your problem? You got a problem with that? Well, they, I guess you're the problem. So that was sort of the messaging, the tacit messaging. And what, what, what the Occupy organizers, hundreds and hundreds of gatherings around the country and encampments, towards the end of the first Obama presidential term was saying was, no, we're not going to accept economic and social inequality. We're going to fight back. And the message didn't really get through to the elites because they were worried about it. They didn't want to hear it. And they were just was like wishful thinking, well, if we don't pay attention, it'll go away. So Obama wins re-election in 2012. And in retrospect, you know, we've been hearing a lot about uh, Donald Trump's narcissism, right? I mean, what a narcissist, right? And I'm not going to disagree with that. I mean, that's one of the more mild diagnoses you might, armchair diagnoses you, you might make. What a disaster, what a horrific president and administration, even worse by many measures than the Reagan administration. This is a dystopian real life nightmare that must be fought against and ended, absolutely essential. At the same time, I gotta say that in political terms, Narcissism is not only to be found at the top of the Republican Party, it's also been in extreme evidence at the top of the Democratic Party. And even the folks who have circled the wagons, like Donna Brazil, for the Democratic Party have to acknowledge, as she did in her book that came out in late 2017, 
that President Obama, especially in his second term, just let the Democrat National Committee go to hell. Who cares about the finances? Who cares about the balance sheets going down and down? Uh, he had already been reelected, and so more and more the Democrat National Committee financially was in shambles, 2013, 2014, 2015. Wow, that's a great way to go into a presidential election cycle, right? And that's part of what we were dealing with, and the absolute hackery that was involved with Debbie Wasserman Schultz being the chair. And something that I've come to believe through experience, I was a Barack Obama delegate to the Democratic National Convention in 2008. I was a Bernie Sanders delegate to the Democratic National Convention in 2016. I've come to believe that we have a top strata leadership of the National Democratic Party that has as its top priority to retain power and control over the Democratic Party. Sure, they would like to defeat Republicans, but that's not the very top priority, which helps to explain the tremendous panic and rage about Bernie Sanders. You know, if you look at some of the interviews that Hillary Clinton gave during her book tour last year, you'll see her saying stuff like, Bernie Sanders, he's not even a Democrat. If he's not going to be in our party, why doesn't he leave us alone? You know, this is like only several decades behind the times. You know, that's the political equivalent of saying, uh, Gee, I hope someday people can carry around telephones that they can call people on. If you look at the numbers, and we talk about this in our autopsy, and by the way, although I'm saying it differently in many respects than what comes across in the autopsy, I want to say that a lot of the points I've been making are in this document, Autopsy, the Democratic Party in Crisis. And all of that document is online at democraticautopsy.org. And so if you look at the trajectory of events, I think those events bear out a comment that Bernie Sanders made to a reporter for the New York Times Magazine about a year ago, so several months after the 2016 general election. And Bernie said there are People in the Democratic Party, by which he was clearly referring to in the leadership of the Democratic Party, who don't mind being on the Titanic as long as they have a first-class cabin. And that speaks to the class nature of control of this party. If you get real about how all this functions, you see a tremendous amount of money changing hands. Now, I went to uh, the Unity Reform Commission final meeting of the Democratic Party la the end of last year, so the very late in 2017. I went with two other co-authors of the autopsy report, which was done independently. It was supported by rootsaction.org. It took months and months to put together. And after we issued the report, we then attended this, what was essentially the final meeting of the Unity Reform Commission of the Democratic Party. And uh, we found that there were people on that, com on that commission who themselves had received very large retainers as consultants from the party. And then they were discussing whether there should be transparency and restrictions on money that goes to consultants for the Democratic Party. It's a huge, for the vendors, the consultants, it's a huge ongoing source of funds. Plus, you have this history, I mean, Tom Daschle is a great example, Howard Dean is a great example, people who have been in the leadership on Capitol Hill and DNC chairs and top officials, then they go off and they make a killing serving the corporate hospital, pharmaceutical, uh, insurance industries, for instance, making fortunes. 
And this is part of the regular gestalt. Now, if they are top officials, if they're members of Congress or they're high up in the DNC, and they're fighting the corporate insurance companies instead of sucking up to them, it's going to curb their income later on when they, or if they try to go through the revolving door. So this is part of the political economy of the Democratic Party. This is a lot of what we're dealing with. And it is a entry point to the underlying, I think, in some ways, the most fundamental contradiction of the Democratic Party, which continues in 2018. And it's no coincidence that the first section of the autopsy report is about corporate power and the party. And I think it's important to note that the events in November of 2016, which continued to be catastrophic, you know, whether you want to cite Tom Perez or uh, the chair of the DNC or Nancy Pelosi, or whether you want to cite Noam Chomsky, they're all correct in this sense, that the Trump administration is an absolute catastrophe in ways too many for us to cover in one evening. So that is a reality. At the same time, we can look at ways in which the Democratic Party has responded without dealing with the fundamental issues of class power, of corporate power, of economic elitism. And the question of where we go from here has to revolve around, to a large degree, where have we been? What's our real experience in the real world, not spinning around? And so in the very introduction to the autopsy, we wrote that after a train wreck, the investigators come in and they focus on what was preventable. They don't talk about, well, you know, there was bad weather and so we'll leave it there. Gee, it snowed. You know, they don't say that. They don't say, uh, the Russians didn't like our train. The Russians did a lot of bad Facebook posts about our train. No, when there's a train wreck, and unfortunately this region, among some others, has had some very tragic experiences with Amtrak train wrecks on occasion. But when that happens, the investigators come in, and presumably with integrity, and they say, what, was, what were the contributing causes to the train wreck? and what's preventable so we can change how we operate for the future and reduce the chances of something like this happening again, something like this disaster. And it's in that sense that the autopsy addresses these questions. It's not, only, it's not to rehash what happened in 2016 for the sake of rehashing. It's about saying, how can we prevent the right wing from triumphing again. And I think it's important for us to remember as progressives, as democratic socialists, any label we want to identify with that has a humanistic meaning to it, it's crucial, I think, to keep in mind, especially in this political era, two fundamental precepts. One is, we must oppose and we must do everything we can through the political and social systems available to us and the cultural changes that we can help to create and what we can do in communities to defeat the right wing, the racist, the xenophobes, the misogynists, the nativists, those who are assaulting our country and the world, not only with the neoliberal economic model, but with so many forms of bigotry and hatred and trying to not only roll back the New Deal, but bring us an oligarchy, which is destruction of democracy, to get rid of the informed consent of the governed such as it exists. And that's one of our two key responsibilities. It always has been, it always needs to be. And the other is to advance 
a genuinely progressive agenda. And because of this now largely mythical, certainly deceptive, linear horizontal line where we've been told, okay, there's the left and the right, and since the right is ascendant, you better move to the center, we often have been conditioned by mass media and Democratic Party leaders and the pundits and you know, MSNBC, which I think might be better called MSDNC, um, we've been conditioned to believe, oh, well, you know, we better move that way because we better move, keep giving ground, keep giving ground to the right wing because that's not the real politics anymore, you know? Um, and the populism, when it's closed off in a progressive direction, did anybody in the world think that Hillary Clinton was a populist candidate? You know, that's oxymoronic. So you close off the avenue for populism and rage against the power structure in a progressive direction. And so what do you leave? Well, on, on your right, as thing goes, you just leave the only door open for the racists and the bigots uh, who have congregated around and been exploited by uh, people like uh, Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions and Paul Ryan and all the rest of it. And so how we think about it then helps to uh, prefigure what we think we can do about it. And one of, I think, the, the many profound points that Bernie Sanders made and continues to make, not only analytically, but in how he proceeded in the campaign for president in 2016, was to explode that paradigm that constricting paradigm, and to say, in effect, no, if you want to defeat the right wing, don't keep moderating and watering down your message. There's a rage out there against the system, and we need to be uh, vehicles for and megaphones for that rage in a progressive way. And that's where the leadership, and I sometimes use that word advisedly, leadership of the Democratic Party, they, they, just don't, they just don't want to hear that. Use the metaphor that uh, uh, Bernie employed when he talked to the New York Times Magazine a year ago. Um, they're set up in their first class cabin. And of course, we can joke about it or roll our eyes about it, but what's at stake? What's at stake is the future of humanity. When we look at climate change and we see the kind of accommodation to the fossil fuel industry that's come out of so much of the Democratic Party, while the Republican Party is uh, led by lunatics who don't believe in basic science around this because they're on the, on the payroll directly or indirectly or contributing uh, gravy train of the fossil fuel industry, then we look at what's at stake, and we gotta say that the Democratic Party needs to be um, saved from itself, saved from its so-called leadership. And that, I think, uh, can get us to key questions about the future, and I wanna wrap up before we get to questions and comments uh, about what might be some useful uh, approaches in the near term and and as a practical matter, not so near term. In the autopsy, as I mentioned, we start out by talking about corporate power and the Democratic Party's affinity uh, with it, its downward uh, synergy with it. And uh, then we talk about the ways in which vital constituencies of the Democratic Party uh, have been uh, utilized and in electoral terms, so to speak, squandered by the Democratic Party uh, more and more. Uh, between uh, 2012 and 2016, the turnout and the votes uh, from people of color uh, fell sharply. If that had not happened, uh, Donald Trump would not be president. Uh, I wrote a piece for the Hill newspaper in August of 2016 and I cited uh, the latest reputable poll, and I said at that point, 
among voters between age of 18 and 29, if the election were held at that point, then Gary Johnson, the Libertarian Party candidate, would get more votes than Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And that should have just been an alarm bell, that kind of fact. But no, the Clinton campaign was, had bigger fish to fry, you know. But you look at the base, the base of people of color, of young people, uh, that should be the future of the Democratic Party. The working class is within a matter of a dozen years or so from now, going to be a majority of people of color in this country. If you go to the younger folks, it's just a matter of till 2021. And yet it's a sort of take people for granted sort of thing, a pat on the head, condescension, yeah, we know you're gonna come out and vote, but if you don't give people something to vote for that's inspiring, then you're not gonna get very far. And as we look ahead to the midterm elections at the end of this year, and then the presidential cycle ending in November of 2020, this is really all up for grabs. There has been, as we wrote about in the chapter on democracy and the party in the autopsy report, a really strong chapter written by a civil rights attorney named Pia Gallegos, who practices in New Mexico. The existence of superdelegates is part of the anti-democratic character of the selection process. You know, 15%, fully 15% of the delegates are just sort of anointed. They're party officials, they're uh, Democrats in the House and Senate. They're not, they're not, they're not elected. Uh, for that purpose at all, and yet they get to vote for who's the president, uh, presidential nominee. And it's even worse than that, because as you'll remember, before a single vote was cast in a primary or caucus for the 2016 nomination for president of the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton was way ahead. You watch CNN and, and the crawl underneath, Hillary Clinton way ahead of Bernie Sanders in delegate count. How did that happen? How did it happen when nobody voted yet for a nominee? And it happened because there were superdelegates. And you had fully half of the superdelegates, like more than 300 of them, had already lined up and declared they were gonna vote for Hillary Clinton before anybody voted. I think Bernie had like three, you know, because the establishment had its thumbs on the scale. That's the way they were manipulating. So there's a battle coming up. It's still to be joined uh, around the country and certainly in this area. These will be some of the key votes. They're members of the Democratic National Committee. There's about 450 of them. And they're gonna vote, it looks like, the final meeting to vote later this summer, 2018, on what's gonna happen with superdelegates. There was a promise because there was so much rage at the uh, convention in Philadelphia in 2016 about this undemocratic process in the party, that there was a proposal to reduce by about 60% of the superdelegates. But there's a huge battle going on. Some people don't want to give it up. Some state party chairs are saying, now let's think about this more clearly. We're party officials, and now there's a proposal to disenfranchise us on the floor of the Democratic National Convention, which is, Bass backwards. It's the superdelegate process that disenfranchises voters. And it's not only that the crawl on CNN on the screen, et cetera, say that superdelegates have given this lead and who the front runner is, it's how the money pours in too, corresponding to that. So I would close by saying that this is a struggle for democracy. The Democratic Party should live up to its first name. And there are people in charge of the party who don't want that to happen. There is a huge gap on one issue after another, single-payer health care, war and militarism, 
steps for genuine equality that can be taken. Seattle, as much as anywhere in the country, providing leadership on Fight for 15. There are so many issues where at the grassroots, people are way more progressive than the top leadership, the Democratic Party on Capitol Hill or the DNC. And so democracy is seen as a threat, perceived as a threat by the leadership. They see democracy as threatening to their power. And democracy for us gives the potential of genuine power for the people, and that's key to the battles ahead. Thanks very much for being here, and I look forward to your questions.